What you gonna do now? What you gonna do now? That's like a no-win situation. All right, guys, grab a Bible. Grab a Bible. We're in Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 11 right here. Congratulations all on surviving one of the most chaotic games that we can play. Hope you enjoyed it. Let's, let's start with a word of prayer and focus in to see what we can learn from the story of the prodigal son about our relationship with God. Luke chapter 15. Gentlemen, if you have hats on, go ahead and take them off, please, while we pray. And we'll close out tonight our series on fellowship with God and move into, Lord willing, the sin nature shortly here, which will, if you listen and pay attention to it and understand it, which is partly my job too, will then give you insight into why you do everything that you do. Pretty impressive concept. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your son, for sending him to die on the cross so that we could have through our faith in him a relationship with you, confidence to know that when we pass from this life, that we will be not in the lake of fire paying the penalty for our sins, but rather we'll be in heaven with you, serving and worshiping you. Thank you for the love that you showed to us in sending him to us. May we walk in that relationship we have. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we have been focusing on the basic doctrines, the basic teachings of the Bible concerning our relationship with God. And there are a lot of us, as we are growing accustomed to, so we'll do, we will need the side conversations down to a non-existent level, basically. So, in order to have a relationship with God, you first must have your sins paid for. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. We've got this little stick figure guy. That's like the pinnacle of my artistic ability. Kneeling at the cross, hopefully you can tell he's kneeling, and we use that to signify, listen up please, we use that to signify and represent a person trusting Jesus to have paid the penalty for their sins. The Bible says that all are sinners, not just certain people, but every person, and that because of that, we will pay a death of separation from God who is righteous and can't have any part with darkness or unrighteousness, we'll pay the penalty for our sins in the lake of fire, unless we trust what Jesus did. And God said, I will send my son. He will die on the cross on your behalf. He'll pay the penalty. All you have to do is trust that that satisfies me. And when, he, when you do that, the Bible says you're taken out of death. You're placed into Christ. You're saved. You're holy and blameless in front of God from Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. And now we have this relationship with God. So I want to be clear. Without trusting Christ to be your Savior, you cannot have a relationship with God. He can't rather have a relation with you because he's righteous and you are still at that point unrighteous because you're not in Christ. Now, simply, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. If we want a relation with God, we've got to trust Christ and be saved and then have that relationship as a result, right? So first things first, salvation has to happen before your relationship with God can be born. The second thing we need to deal with then is what happens when you trust Christ to be your Savior. What kind of relationship do you have with God? Are you friends? Are you just two individuals that know each other now? What is it? No, you are his child. The Bible says that when you trust Jesus Christ to be your Savior, 1 John 5, 1, that you are born spiritually from God. He is your spiritual father. You are his spiritual child. And now you are in a father-son or father-daughter relationship. He will lovingly lead you and guide you to teach you what's best for you and show you how best to think, how best to walk, in a way that benefits you, and you have the opportunity to experience that relationship with him, where you can loving how righteous the God of the universe is. It's an unbelievable relationship. The Bible says, I has not seen nor has, hear, nor has ear heard the things that are prepared for those who love God. And all this is provided to us because God loves us, but we have to accept what he's done and trust his son, to be our Savior. We've focused on this idea of fellowship, this idea of having a right relationship with God. You don't always have a right relationship together, yeah? You guys are older in this group compared to our junior high group. 
I know most of you guys, not like yourselves personally, everything you're going through, clearly, but I know where you're at in life, there's a lot of friction between you and your parents, typically. That's typically the case. Because you're growing up, you're about ready to step out on your own, and we oftentimes think that we're more ready than we are, or that our parents think we are to do so. We're going to hear a story tonight of a son, or as I like to call it also, the parable of the loving father. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 15, and you'll see that the prodigal son did exactly what many of you are getting ready to do, what many of you probably have done already, and that's to step out away from your parents. Now, he did so in a different way than you hopefully will do it. Let's take a look at Luke 15, 11. I'm going to read a bunch of verses here to get through the story. We'll go all the way to verse 24. Here we go. Jesus is talking and says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be in need. And he went and attached himself to one of the citizens. He hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him to eat. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger? I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. And he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him. He ran out and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us be eat and be merry. For the son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to be merry. Now, this story is a parable, so it's teaching us through a human concept the spiritual truth, the spiritual reality of our relationship with God. Notice it doesn't start out and say that a man had a stranger, had two strangers. And it starts out, he says that a man had two sons. When we are born into the family of God by our faith in Christ, we are begotten of God, his children, so we are born into God's family, just like in this parable, the father had two sons. They're his children. This, doesn't, this story does not teach us about salvation. It doesn't teach us that we need to be saved, and that's how we're made alive again, and that's how we are lost but now, but now found. That's how it's typically been used. But it, if, you, if you harmonize it, if you work it together with other passages in Scripture to see how it matches up with them, you find quickly that salvation is not the message here. This is teaching about the relationship the father has with his children. And the father in this parable is represented, or is representing God the father. The sons then are all believers. Any believer, and specifically in this parable, is two involved. And they have two different responses. Now, one of the things that we find kind of odd, just with our culture, is that when the, when the son wants to go away from his father, what does he do? He goes to his father and says, hey, give me that portion which is coming to me. He's asking for it to be like, that's just so rude. Hey, dad, I want my inheritance. I'm out of here. Yeah, that's not how it works for us. Now, it's not exactly how it worked for them either. When we get to Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 at some point, we're going to deal with this word adoption of sons. It's the Greek word huiathesion. And it identifies a rite of, a rite of passage ceremony that the children the male children in the family would go through when they became an adult in the family. And they would get five rights at this ceremony. Girls, you have a birthday called the Sweet Sixteen. Uh, uh, Mexican culture, it has the quinceañera, right? And that, that's, that is the representative of the, the girl becoming the woman, right? That's a part of it, yeah? The Jewish culture has a similar thing. It's a bar mitzvah. Uh, but we, we don't really have this. When you turn 18, that's kind of like in America. You're like, yeah, you're an adult now. Go get a job. Leave the house. Like, whatever. Like, and your mom's like, no, stay here. Or she's like, no, get out of here. Um, <laughs> Okay, we digress. So, so when, 
when this rite of, cere- rite of passage ceremony occurred, when this boy child in the family became a man in the family's eyes, and in the eyes of Rome at the time, he gained five rights. One of them was the ability to take a down payment on his future inheritance. Now, that'd be pretty sweet. Think about what you could do if you went to your parents and said, hey, I'm an adult now. I'd like a down payment on what I'm going to get when you pass, what you're going to leave to me when you pass. Now, someone might be like, good luck, here's 10 cents, like, <laughs> right? <laughs> but and whatever the situation, it would be very beneficial and, and useful for us to be able to get some of that so we could go, like, put a down payment on a house, or we could be like the prodigal son and just, like, <laughs> blow through it, right? Heard a story the other day about a lady who won the lottery. She won, like, $700 million or something like that. And within two years, it was gone. What, well, that was, the, that was the question she was asked. She said, I spent it on yachts, partying. Like, I, I rented out yachts for all my friends. We flew places first class, and she just, like, this is all she did, right? She just totally wasted all that money she got, much like what happened with the prodigal son, right? So the prodigal son, he gets this down payment, which was rightfully his to ask for. He gets the down payment from his father, and he says, See ya, I'm going away. He leaves his father's land where he had a house, where he had stability, where he had all the food he would ever need. Everything that he had need for, his father provided for him while he was there. He steps out, goes says to a foreign land. In this foreign land, he wastes his money. It says in verse 13, he squanders it with loose living. I mean, he's just not taking care of it, just not being careful with it. He's just spending it however he wants. Okay? And it goes away to the point that now he is completely broke. And when you're broke, and you don't have parents, you don't have friends, you've got to get a job. That's the sad reality of things. So he gets a job, and he's feeding these pigs food, and he's so hungry, because no one's giving him anything to eat. He's so hungry, he's looking at the slop that the pigs were getting, and he's going, man, I want something to eat, and I'm just look, starting to look good to me. But then look at what it says in verse 17. It starts with this phrase, but when he came to his senses. I don't know about you, but there's plenty of times in my life I can look back and I go, what on earth am I doing here? Appreciate the support. <laughs> and this is where this prodigal son ends up. He's finding himself in the pig pen. He's feeding the the food to the, the pig, isn't it? Because it's just pig slop. All the unwanted food. And he comes to his senses and says, you know, even the servants in my father's house have everything they need. So he tries to go back to his father to become a servant. But his father doesn't let him. What's his father do when he comes back? Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He'd practiced this statement. He said this statement. And his father doesn't even respond to it in the parable. Yeah, that's great. Now, to the servants, hey, go bring the fattened calf. Let's kill it. We're going to have a feast. We're going to celebrate. My son's back. This is a picture of our relationship with God. When we, as his children, stop walking with him, stop obeying him and following him, we leave fellowship with God. We're separated from having fellowship with him. Remember, God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. We say that we have fellowship with him, but walk in the darkness. We lie and do not practice the truth, 1 John 1, 5 through 7. And so when we stop walking in the light, we leave fellowship. Now the Bible says that we're walking in carnality. We've called it walking in the darkness from 1 John 1, 5 through 10. Get that out of your way. This is the foreign land. Was that like perfectly in your way? Let me get this out of your way. <laughs> So glad it has wheels. All right. So carnality in the parable is the foreign land. Remember, he leaves his father. Where does he go? Foreign land. Who's the father in the parable? God the father. His son. That's you and I, believers. We leave. We're in carnality. We go to the foreign land. And now, what, what do we do? We waste the relationship with God that we have. We act like he doesn't exist. We act like he's not truly in charge. That he's not sovereign. We act like he doesn't know best. We just totally live like he doesn't even exist. And what's worse is when we were saved, he gave us his Holy Spirit to live inside of us, to indwell us. First Corinthians says, do, not, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Talk. So now, not only are we walking away from God, apart from him, but now we're dragging his Holy Spirit 
through the pig pen that we're in, in the foreign land. And we have to, at some point, come to our senses. There's another story that talks about this kind of concept. Similar idea, although it's not necessarily teaching the same thing. But we see how we return to God in this story. Jonah 1 through chapter 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah saying, Arise, Jonah, and go to Nineveh and preach and cry out against it. And what's, what's Jonah do? See ya. He heads west as far as he can go to Tarshish, which is the bottom, into, or bottom part of Spain. He gets on a boat to try and get there, but the Lord brings up a great storm, keeps the boat from going. They try to row back. That doesn't work. They try to throw cargo over, lighten the ship. That doesn't work. Start praying, let's go. And then they say, okay, what's happening here? Jonah says, it's my fault. They said, tell us who you are. I'm a prophet of Israel, of the Lord God. So they've heard about the Israelites' God. He's actually done things, whereas the other gods haven't. They've witnessed his power. They've witnessed him doing all these things. They've heard the stories about it. They say, how could you have done this? What shall we do to appease him, to satisfy him? And he says, throw me overboard into the raging waters that are there, and he will deliver you. At this point, Jonah knows he's toast, right? He's defied God, storm comes up, it's clearly his fault. And so they first try, say, nope, we'll try to row again. Doesn't work, storm gets worse. So then they pray to God, they say, please don't let his blood come onto us. Don't let us be guilty of killing him. Because you have done what you wanted here, God. And so they throw him overboard, and he gets swallowed by a big fish. Some of you guys would like to catch this fish, I'm sure. Feed us all for days. Now, he gets swallowed by this big fish, and for three days and three nights, he's in the belly of this great fish. But what changes? If you read Jonah chapter 2, you find that while he is there, coming to the end of those 72 hours, coming to the end of his life in that fish, he repents. He remembers who the Lord God of hosts is. He confesses to God. God causes the great fish to vomit him up onto the shore, and then God says, all right, now go to Nineveh. Two chapters of the book of Jonah could have totally been avoided if he'd just gone to Nineveh, not to mention all the things he suffered along the way. He was in the foreign land. He was in carnality. He was walking away from God. We do the same thing when we stop obeying God and choose to follow our own plans, choose to seek out our own desires and satisfy them. But when we come to our senses, we confess our sins, as 1 John 1, 9 says. And that moves us back into a right relation with God. 1 John 1, 9, you've heard me quote it before. Perhaps you've not. It says, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's talking to believers, so it's not dealing with the penalty for our sins. And 1 John 2, 1 comes in and says that if, or he's writing these things to us so that we may not sin, but even if we do, we still have an advocate who is the propitiation for our sins. That's Jesus Christ the righteous. So believers, you are saved forever. When you sin, you leave fellowship with God. You walk in the carnality in the foreign land. But when you confess, your salvation is completely untouched. Because everything you did here is charged to the blood of Jesus Christ. You paid the penalty for it once and for all. Everything you will do that violates God's standard. How can that be? God's omniscient. He knows all things. He knows what you've done that sin. He knows what you're doing that sin. Perhaps something you're not let go of yet. And he knows what you will do before you die. That's sin. He knows every one of us is in that. He still sent his son down the cross for us. He still secures us in him when we trust him. And all he says is, walk with me and I will show you the best way to live. And we go, you know, I think this is a good idea. And I go, I'm a horrible person. This didn't make me happy. I feel ashamed. I feel guilty. And hopefully at that point we come to our senses and go, that's opposite of what God says, so I should just go back to doing what God says. In the app, we put out a Devo yesterday, a really short little blurb. This is walking with God is trusting him. That's what it comes down to. Does God know what's best or does he not? 
if you believe that he does, you'll seek him, you'll follow him in his word when he shows you, because that's how he teaches us, is through his word. But if you don't believe that, then you won't. And so everything about this relationship with God comes down to, do you trust the God of the universe who sent his son to die on the cross for your sins? Do you trust that he will provide everything that you need? That he will show you a better way of living than living for yourself and satisfying whatever desire you have? And you know what? This relationship, it's the most important thing as a believer you can understand is how this process works. Because when we're walking the foreign land, we're walking apart from God. And all it takes is for us to come to our senses, confess our sin, we'll get back in fellowship and walk with him once more. Now look at what happened in the parable of the prodigal son. The son came back, you know, I don't deserve this to be your son. We didn't deserve to be God's children. If you believe that salvation is because you deserve it, then you will never truly be confident that you're saved. Salvation is simple. God loved you while you were a sinner and sent his son to die on the cross for your sins. If you trust that that's true, you're saved forever. If you don't, you got you to do that. Okay? Otherwise, like a fire, burn and it's forever. It's not like for a short time. Eternal separation from God. Now let's deal with a couple of things in this passage that I, I highlighted when I read it, but I haven't touched yet. Go back down to Luke 15, and we want to look at where the son comes back in verse 21 and gives his father that prepared speech he had for him. Verse 21 says, And the son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice he says in the story, I have sinned against heaven. We sin against God the Father. Where's God the Father? He's in heaven. Jesus, again, is using a human idea, things that we understand, going back to our own home, to our own earthly father, but he still separates the reality that we do not sin against other people. Sin is between us and God. We do things that are wrong toward other people, but they're not going to judge us for that sin. God is. When we sin, it's purely between us and God. Now, if we've hurt somebody else and we've done the wrong thing toward them, we need to take care of that situation. The Gospels also tell us that if, there's, if you know something between you and your brother or you and your neighbor, that you should then fix that and then come before God to deal with it. So there's, it's not that we don't do wrong things to other people and, and we don't have a response to take care of that. We certainly do. But sin is purely between us and God. We sin against heaven in the story, it said. Now, if Jesus was talking to us plainly, spiritually about what he's saying, he said he would have then brought in, I believe, the idea that we sin against God purely because that's his point. We don't sin against our earthly fathers. We disobey them and we sin in front of God. And people around us can see our sin. First thing that I wanted to highlight was that difference. And then, I don't know if you guys have ever thought of what the second brother felt. Because remember, the story began, the father had two sons. The one went away, the other stayed put. Here's what happened to the other son. Luke 15 25 says, Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. They were having a party, and he didn't even know it. No invitation. Like, he's just out working. They're having a party. All right? You can see already what you might start feeling that. Now, let's keep going. But he became angry. Oh, didn't see that coming. All right? But he became angry and was not willing to go in. His father came out and began pleading with him to come in. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, I have never neglected a command of yours, and yet you have never even given me a little that I'm merry with my friends. My translation is kind of funny. It says kid, which means a baby goat. You don't even give me a little kid. <laughs> That's a cultural difference, right? Kid can refer to a baby goat. 
Okay, most translations now translate that little goat. One reason we need to understand culture and history here. You didn't give me a baby goat that I might be married with my friends, but when this son of yours came home who has devoured your wealth, you killed the fattened calf for him and said to him, my child, you have always been, w-, the father said back to him, my father, you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours, but we had to be merry and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and it was lost and has been found. Our relationship with God and another person's relationship with God are separated. When you do the right thing, good. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what's best for you. When somebody else doesn't, but you did, and then they go, you know, I wasn't the right thing, come back, celebrate with them. Don't demand praise for doing what you're supposed to be doing. There's, there's one more thing, and that last sin is the first of chapter 15 I want to point out. What is it the Father said? He said it twice now. We had to be merry and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live. He was lost and has been found. In the story, we didn't hear anything about the prodigal son dying when he was in the foreign land, did we? So we know this clearly isn't talking about a physical type of death that occurred in the story. What we have here is the idea of separation from God. See, God is walking in the light, this fellowship circle, and when we sin, we are separated from him. This is this is a temporary separation from fellowship with God. If God's in the light, and he is, and he's walking in the light, and he is, and we're in the darkness, walking in the darkness, which we saw was righteousness and unrighteousness, if we're walking in the darkness, then we're separated from him. Scripture, when it uses death, most of the time the picture of death in Scripture is of a separation between two things. And it destroys a relationship when things are separated. So Jesus in the parable uses that idea to bring about the, the realization and the reality that when we are walking in darkness, we are separated from God, separated from fellowship with him. What does that have to do with our salvation? Nothing. It's secure forever in Christ. We're just in the foreign land on our way to the pig's pen when we have everything we need, a God who loves us and will lead us, who knows what's best for us, and will continually pay, forgive us for our sins when we confess them back to him and say, let's go. Let's go right back to what we're doing. That, that's going to f- finish up our study on fellowship. We're going to move into the sin nature in the near future. Encourage you to come back for that. As it will help you understand why you go back to the pig pen when you say, I'm never going back there again. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us in spite of what we do, for knowing who we really are if we were to walk with you and be your children. Lord, you know all things and you know the pig pens that we walk to. Help us to come to our senses quickly, to seek out the perfect love that you show us and start to be curious about what my life might be like outside of that pig pen if we were just to walk with you. All these things we pray and ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you guys next week, Lord willing.